Hello, everybody. We are here today to do a slightly different format uh, to showcase what it's like to be uh, in our writing room. Uh, for this, we thought we would use something that's actually published. Uh, it's a little bit older, but its name uh, people probably heard of. It's the uh, Prince in Amber. It's called The Great Book of Amber is the one we're going to be doing, Great Book of Amber. Uh, but we're specifically looking at the nine princes uh, in Amber because it's a collection of short stories uh, by Roger Zelazny. And obviously people can let me know if I butchered that name through saying it. But the idea is we want to show, uh, you know, uh, a known fantasy writer, again, maybe uh, for the younger folk out there, you might not have heard of Roger before, but uh, you should you should now. Um, as an example of what it's like to be in a writing group and do uh, what we do of commenting on things we like in a particular chapter and then commenting on things that are second looks. Um, now, obviously, uh, you know, Roger is no longer with us, uh, so he's not going to be able to respond, but that is actually also relatively normal uh, in a writing group that while you are getting feedback on a chapter you have submitted, uh, you are just meant to sort of take in uh, the likes and second looks. Um, you know, asking a question at the end is sort of, you know, an optional thing you could do with your writing group. But we wanted to model what a writing group chapter session feedback could look like um, in the hopes of helping everybody uh, have, you know, healthy, good groups. Uh, we've already done a session before on writing groups. You can listen to that. And obviously it's not one size fits all. Uh, you got to find what works for you. Uh, but this methodology has worked very well for us. Uh, so we thought it would be good to, uh, you know, give you all the chance to see what it's like. Uh, before we dive into that, Cameron, Erica, did you have any of your own quick comments about this before we begin our, our likes of Nine Princes in Amber? Uh, I've loved this book since I was about 12, so I may be a little biased. <laughs> this book is much older than I am, but I went in, I was pleasantly surprised. I like it, and Jeff assigned us to read the first 12 pages as a sample chapter, and I'm this much the way through it. I like it. It's keeping me company for a while. Cool. Erica, was that a dig at our age? Was that? I, I thought I heard. Uh... I'm saying I'm young, not that you're old. Also, I only read. <laughs> I mean, but by implication, right? Right. I also only read chapter one for this, so well, that's only six pages. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how far we go for this. Uh, but um, but yeah, maybe, maybe we'll get some comments uh, with the rest as well. Uh, it has been a while since I've read this book, but it was really nice to to go back to. But we normally spend 15 minutes on each person. Um, because we have, you know, a, a large group, obviously that amount of time could vary. And we spend roughly about eight minutes talking about likes. Uh, there are only three of us here though, so we may not go that long. Uh, and then the remainder of the time on second looks. So let's talk about some likes. What do we enjoy about this? I think amnesia plots are really hard to pull off because mm -hmm. they bring you in when you don't know what's going on, the character doesn't go know what's going on. And I think it's done really masterfully here because the narrator eventually we learn his name we don't know his name at the get-go at the beginning of chapter one has this really flippant competency he wakes up he's in the hospital he has amnesia he doesn't know quite how he got there and if the people who put him in the hospital are friends or enemies but he knows that he wants to get out and he's just really sassy and he's picking fights with all the doctors Runs a lawsuit, does some brute force violence to, to get himself out of there. And so that's selling me on the amnesia plot because he knows where he's going, even though he doesn't know what he's come from. He's got a goal. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that, that it is tricky to do amnesia because how do you make us interested in a character that's is like a blank slate, right? That's like figuring out themselves. Um, but much like in, say, Born Identity, where we see hidden competency for violence, you know, there. Um, here, we get hidden competence for sassitude. Um, and I, I would agree that, you know, relatively early on, um, he seems competent in the way he's analyzing things. He's asking questions that seem similar to what like, I would ask myself. So yeah, I would agree that one of the things I really liked about this was that even though this character doesn't know a lot about themselves, we are still learning a great deal about what type of person this character is just through the way he behaves and reacts to this situation. I thought it was a lot of fun to get an amnesia plot. I mean, it, it, it's an older code, but it checks out, right? Yeah. It, 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 
you don't see, I, I, I don't know if you would say that the uh, amnesia trope has been retired exactly, mm -hmm. but you sure see a lot less of it in current fiction than you did when this was written, which by the way, this was uh, copyright 1970. It is more than 50 years old, uh, which uh, I, I, myself being closer to 50 than 30, I, I'm, I'm a little sensitive there. Um, but nevertheless, he does it really well. And I think he gets by on the strength of the voice that he introduces mm -hmm. right from the first few sentences where you want to hear what this person has to say and how he's going to do things, even though uh, you're like, really, we're, we're doing amnesia? Okay. He, he sells it, he, uh, at least for me, I, I was able to go with it. I was going to say, it doesn't feel like it's written 50 years ago. It's to me, you know, it, it's definitely got a style to it, which uh, is my next like, uh, which is something else that I think uh, draws us in beyond, you know, the mystery of, you know, who is this person, where are they, um, and the sass uh, that he's got this character, but also the writing style. Uh, there's just some really fun turns of phrases that are used, like there's just skill. <laughs> you, can, you can feel it uh, with the way some of this is done. Um, just an example is something that happens uh, right at the end of um, the first chapter. And I, I'm bringing it up because it's an example of uh, this, this show versus tell, which you can hear a lot. And right at the end, it says, I snubbed out my cigarettes, picked up another, and removed perhaps 200 pounds from my feet by resting in a brown upholstered chair beside his bookcase. So, you know, in that moment, we're learning that, oh, this person is 200 pounds, right? And we're learning that at the end of the chapter. Uh, yeah, it's, it's right there, right before that last little bit. Um, but that's just such a cool way to tell us the size of the character, right? Um, and of course, use it perhaps because he doesn't really know, right? It's the unusual plot. He's not sure. He hasn't weighed himself recently. Um, but there's lots of little moments like this um, that I think are also engaging. Uh, and I liked because I'm not only liking the way the character is reacting to things, I'm liking the way I'm getting that information in the writing style for the most part. I got, I've got a couple of second looks, but overall, I, I like the way it was phrased. The one that caught my eye in terms of his, his excellent phrasing mm -hmm. was uh, closer to the beginning of the chapter. He talks about the old moon cradling the new moon. And mm -hmm. I had to sort of stop on that one for a second and go, wait a minute, are there two moons in the sky? But then I realized, oh wait, the moon, new moon is when it's dark. The old moon is when, when it's light. And so he's talking about a crescent mm -hmm. moon with the, the darkness nestled inside the light. And that was really cool. Um, just some some excellent turns of phrase, I agree. I'm sorry, Eric, I, I was just gonna say something to that, but Eric, I do wanna give you a chance. I don't wanna monopolize. My favorite, probably my top moment from this chapter is this verbal sparring he does with the doctor a couple mm -hmm. pages before what you have up on the screen where he beats up a nurse, gets into the doctor's office, and he's trying to figure out who he, who he is and who checked him into the hospital. And the doctor tells him, your sister check, checked you in. And he doesn't know if he has a sister or what his sister's name is. So something that I'm going to continue to like over the course of the next several chapters is he does a very good job at acting like he's, he knows what he's talking about when he knows absolutely nothing. And they have this short conversation yeah. where he goes, which sister? Evelyn. And he says, well, that's ridiculous. I haven't seen Evelyn in years. She didn't even know I was in this part of the country. And there's so much going on there because he doesn't know what state he's in, doesn't know if he's if, if he's in America or some other country, eventually figure out there's different worlds. So he's finding ways to play up that he knows what's, what's going on while disguising that he knows absolutely nothing. I would completely agree with that. And that's, it is, it is a lot of fun to see that. Um, I was gonna make a comment about that, that moon part because to me it was beautiful, but it did also make me feel like, wait a second, you just, you just like knocked out the orderly um, you need to be getting out of here. What, what are you doing looking at the moon cradling itself? Um, but he, he sold me, because that, that was going to be a second look. I was going to be like, would, would the character really do this right now? But he sold me right at the very end, um, well, well, the middle, I should say, where it says nothing to show for me where this place was located. So it's like, oh, okay, okay. We, we can learn about the moon and the poplars and it can be, it can be beautiful uh, because you know, you're justifying it, that, that he's looking around trying to figure out 
uh, where he's located. So I thought that that was just a nice job of, you know, uh, being skillful in justifying, giving us little visual moments like that. You know? He does some pretty cool punctuation things, uh, which, you know, <laughs> for non-writers, they may not care about. Um, but I thought it was fascinating that he has the orderly after he punches him uh, with a very foul blow, uh, speak just in lines. <laughs> like it's just, it's just like, who knows what he's saying? Who knows what's happening? Um, I, I'm going to comment a little bit about that later. Uh, but overall, I thought that was really cool. Um, and there's another moment where um, the main character responds to the information that they're getting about the sister checked you in. It's literally just a question mark in quotes. Yeah, right there at the bottom. It's like, question mark, thought I. It's like, what? So it's just, it's so cool that he did it because you, you know what it means, but I, I haven't seen that before, right? And again, this is like 50 years ago. Um, just super cool. I, I yeah, that is a very that. unique yeah. construction. Yeah. Let me see if I can find the other. Oh yeah, here it is, mm -hmm. where he's essentially censoring the, the guard swearing. Oh, yours looks slightly different than mine. We're, we're going to talk about that. Okay. Um, yeah. For sure, for sure. Uh, we are right about a time for likes. Do we have any last big ones we wanted to bring up? I will say uh, this straddles the line between like and second look. Mm. Um, having read this entire series and knowing where it goes, I think it's pretty ballsy to uh, start in a location and in a milieu that is so far from where we're going to end up. Um, I would worry if I were doing this that uh, I'm making promises I'm not going to keep to the reader by putting them in the real world and making things fairly well grounded. Um, now, I think he, it, it, as I remember, he does a pretty good job holding our hand through that transition. Um, but this is, this is miles away from where we're going to end up. And uh, it surprised me coming back to read it after a long time. Uh, just how different it is from the rest of the story. Yeah, I'll be talking about that a little bit myself. So yeah, I hear that, I hear that. Uh, Erica, did you have a uh, last like? I've got one last, so I'll just say real quick when you're finished. I'm ready to move into second looks as soon as, soon as you're ready, so you can go okay, ahead. Cool. So my, my last one was just, I, I think this chapter really leaves, this is only six pages, um, and for me at least, it definitely left me ready to be like, okay, what's <laughs> well, what's next uh what's happening um because you know we're already we're in and we're out of this place we're we're leaving on a cab to places unknown um so i think it's pretty deft how quickly uh we are in this completely unknown environment that he has no control over and then he ends with basically a complete control you know money a gun a car uh, he did pretty well for himself in six pages second looks so what second looks do we have everybody Cameron touched on this earlier, but yeah, so I knew going in that I was supposed to expect fantasy because Jeff had introduced this to me as a fantasy series. So even though I didn't grow up with it like you and Cameron did, I knew I was supposed to expect that. And I'm looking at the cover and it, it won't show up that well, but we have this knight type figure standing with a castle in the, in the background. And there's what look like hordes of goblins or trolls or something having a battle. So I knew I was supposed to ex expect fantasy. And what I get is a modern hospital with this character who doesn't seem disoriented to be in the modern in the modern world. And I wanted a clue of fantasy, just a signposting of where I was going to end up later. And because of that, I read the old moon cradling with the new moon as a fantasy hint. I thought, okay, we must be in a world with two moons because even though I'm seeing a normal hospital environment, my brain's primed to expect fantasy and I'm making up hints where hints don't exist. Yeah, I have to admit that I had that same thought. I was like, wait, are, are there two moons? Because I'm not sure. But then he talks about New York later. So, you know, it, it, yeah, I agree with that. Even though I like the turn of phrase, it's ambiguous. Yeah, I, I had the same moment. Uh, you know, I think the cover is doing the heavy lifting here, right? Uh, the cover is really making that that promise. You know, they, oh no, we got you. I love all the different covers. We got, we're rocking here. I've got... Uh, this one, which is just more kind of the, the city with a moon. It's like, is, is this the moon? Uh, but no, uh, it's like a, a city with a mountain and everything. Um, so from the cover, where it's shelved, where you're purchasing it, you know uh, that it's supposed to be fantasy. So it is, uh, I think it is a bit of shock, but I do also wonder 
How much of that is because it was the seventies and we needed to justify our portal fiction of, you know, everything's normal. We got this, you understand, right? Now we're gonna do this somewhere else and you're still <laughs> gonna like it, right? You like this, right? You'll like it when I bring in the crazy stuff. So, you know, I, I do wonder how much of that um, is the time. But yeah, I, I think it's a little risky. It's a, it's a little risky to come in this way if, if you know, we were thinking about publishing now. Uh, you could still be using the cover to create those expectations, but I think people would be primed and ready and wanting that in the moons, as everyone has said. Yep. My biggest second look for this chapter was that the, the, our protagonist does not realize he doesn't know who he is until nearly half the way through the chapter. And quite a bit of time has passed and he's been thinking about, oh, wait, there's been this accident. Uh, I don't even remember exactly what happened. And it's not until after he's had a conversation with someone, he's like, wait, I don't know who I am. And I just question the reality of that occurring. Like there, there's too much, at least in my head, too much self-centered thinking going on for me to not realize I don't know who I am for hours before I knock out an orderly. I get right. Um, I, I knock out everybody the second they're locked in the room. Of course. Um, for me, I was going to say that I was okay with the timing of it just because I feel like it is easy to sort of scroll around and get focused on one thing or another thing. Um, but what was a little unrealistic to me was he says, I don't know who I am. And he's like, and then to distract myself, I started doing other activities, which I get the idea of distracting, but I, I would have thought that would have been a bit of a, a bigger, like, <laughs> like, you know, don't get me wrong, he seems very competent. Um, but I expected him to get shook just a little bit more yeah. uh, by that. My biggest overall second look is the fantasy element that is present in the first chapter. He's in a hospital. He has this vague idea he's been in a car crash and he's wearing casts at some point. And then he tears off the cast and his body is perfectly fine. And he doesn't really question it. And as of yet, he doesn't know anything, including how reality works. And so I was expecting him to have some kind of pause where he wondered, okay, why is my body fine? Was I actually ever injured? Is there some grand conspiracy to gaslight me and they want me to think I'm unstable in a hospital or have I been miraculously healed? Am I used to this? Does this work in my reality? What is reality? And because I'm primed to expect a fantasy, I wanted to dwell on miracle healing well, he just seems to take it all in stride and it's time to go knock out a nurse and, and go get to the doctor and get out of here. Yeah, I speaking of the sort of fantasy miracles, for me, it was ripping off the casts. I'm like, what, what kind of casts are these? But he's just like, nope, we done with this. Um, which, you know, again, it's cool. Like, you know, if he can do that. <laughs> like rip off a cast. Awesome. Um, but I I wish I could have known a little bit more about the cast to know if was that a feat of strength or not. I don't know. Um, were I they some of those old style plaster casts? I mean, which if you had a pry bar, I mean, you, you might do some damage to your leg jamming it in between, but you could get you could you could tear that apart without. Too much. I, I think you could, and I, I think that's just the sort of trigger. It's like what's what's norm, right? Yeah. Uh, with just so just getting a comment for that maybe. Um, and then the same for the, the healing, because at the end, he does say, I would always heal quickly, right? Um, but that does seem, if you're like, your legs are broken, you, should, you shouldn't be walking. Um, you know, yeah, what, what is that action? So I, I would agree with that second look. Uh, we're right around the normal time. Do we have any last second look? I want to talk about this. The, uh, the censoring of the swearing. You knew where I was going next. Oh man, <laughs> that was my last it one. It took me out of it so much. Like, I, I'm used to seeing this in novels written in the 1800s, right? Um, where I'm, I, I'm letting you know that the person is cursing, but uh, this, this is friendly fiction here, and we're not going to say that stuff. Granted, I am very used to contemporary fantasy and sci-fi where nobody makes any bones about swearing, um, and, and it's very common. Um, but this just felt antiquated, far older than 1970. Um, and, and maybe this was still part of the, the, the convention at that time, but I can't think of anything else that does this. So, one, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please, it's fine. One very technical consideration I have for this, if you're going to attempt this in modern times, is the 1800s did not have audiobooks, and audiobooks 
certainly there is technology where you could record things in the 1970s, but you didn't have your little audible app in, in your pocket that you could listen to all day, every day, like we do today. And right. I don't know how you read blank, blank in audio format. And I also don't know what to do with the question mark. I almost think the blank, blank is easier to work with than question mark, thought I. So there's a lot less you can get away with if you're supposed to be reading with your ears instead of your eyes. That's a good yeah, that is, that's an interesting point. Um, what I was going to say is it looks different on this than it does in my book. In my book, those lines, I don't know how you'll be able to see them, um, but the lines are in the middle. So they're not at the bottom. Interesting. So what that read to they're me- like big long M dashes. Uh, what, yeah, so that's what they look like, the big long M dashes. I thought it was like, and we're like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like you couldn't talk because you had just gotten punched. Oh. So that's, how, I didn't read it as censoring. I read it as like, he's trying to talk, but he can't make words because he just got punched in the nuts. Um, <laughs> but because of that, I then did not understand how he was able to talk. I, I understood how he was able to say, we've got ways to deal with patients like you would gasp. I'm like, okay, he got his breath back. He can talk now. But then I didn't understand the second. Now there's a clue there where it says he repeated, right? If I had read more carefully, I could have been like, oh, he's, I guess, actually, actually saying the same thing. But in my head, it was like, oh, I guess he can't talk anymore. Like it was just like a gasp. He was like able to say something and now he's back in pain and he can't again. So it, it did affect what, what I thought it was uh, because of the position. Interesting. Yeah, it just read as very Dickensian to me, right? Uh, we're, we're too polite to say these things, but other people say them. I mean, granted, in, in those older novels, usually it will be the name of God or something like that, and they'll just have the G up front and then dashes to indicate that that's what's been said. Um, but that was the closest that I could come to, and so that's what I figured this was. I don't, I don't know what else it could be. Well, it's it. two words and he's repeating it. I, I think I know what he's saying. So I, I just, I just wasn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and, especially, and granted, I haven't read these books in several decades, but I have a memory of them as being fairly forthright and maybe just a hint crude, which is probably why I liked them as a, as a young teenager. And so I'm surprised to find this kind of self-censorship right up front. I, I, I just don't understand it. And there's some mild swearing later on. So in the context of having read a little more of the book, even though I haven't read the whole series like, like you have, it does seem confusing to see it up front right here. Yeah. I wonder if that was just to get people into the book, to get them liking it, or, or if, or if again, it is what I'm thinking where you can't talk. I don't know, maybe, maybe, because that, that would well, explain the difference. And it's quite likely that using the F word in your first chapter three times uh, in 1970 meant something different than it does right now, so. Right, exactly, exactly. But that, we, we are at time, we're a little bit over because, you know, well, there, there's a lot to talk about with six pages. Of that, which, what is, there's, there, there was a lot going on, obviously. Um, but that's an example of what uh, likes and second looks look like. Um, the idea is to um, not, not necessarily give recommendations, right? We're not here saying, like, this is what they should be doing, um, but more to say, these are the moments I enjoyed, maybe even saying an emotion you felt while, like, while you're reading it, like, this was funny to me, or that was fun, or I really liked this, I felt immersed, or I like that character, I want to know more about him, things like that. Um, and then with Second Looks, again, not saying, like, you must change this, but just saying, you know, I was, I was confused, I thought there were two moons, maybe, because it was fantasy, or I, 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 I thought this meant that he couldn't speak, and then he couldn't speak again, or I thought I was when he was swearing. It's more just providing information about, like, these were moments that were maybe unsure about, or here's what I experienced. Is that what you wanted the reader to experience? Um, because the goal of this is not to turn it into any of our books, um, but more just to try, to the best of our ability, uh, give uh, reader reactions to it. Uh, did either of you have any last comments you want to give on this uh, little experiment we did? No, I think that pretty much covers it for me. Yeah, I think this is a pretty fair model of what our operating procedure is like in our writing group and probably in many writing groups with similar similar procedures. And if you're interested in starting a writer's group of your own, this might be a good template to see if you want to do something similar to what we've done. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we hope this helped. If you liked it or would like to see more of these, uh, let us know in the comments. But most importantly, uh, keep writing. And we'll see you next time, Blackheads. <laughs>